So tell us a little bit about yourself, Douglas. Uh, so my name is Douglas, Kilo Alpha 2 Uniform Papa Whiskey. And uh, quite some time ago, I got interested in batteries because a lot of the satellites that amateurs launch, the electronics are still working, but the batteries die. And that's the end of the mission when the batteries die. They're, they're not designed to run completely off the solar panels. So when uh, one or two of the cells in the battery pack fail or reverse or don't hold a charge, that's the end of the satellite's life. And it's, it seems to be a shame because the rest of the electronics are all still working. And we'd still have a working satellite in orbit with a transponder, except that the batteries have died. So there are some missions, some amateur missions that had some batteries that performed very, very well. Um, yes, the uh, U11 satellite that the University of Surrey launched, as well as the Microsats had some very long lived battery packs. The uh, U11 of cells was matched by uh, Larry Kayser uh, and a, a team that he led. They had a matching process that they went through um, and the batteries on U11 lasted for a really long time. And one of the questions was, well, why did the U11 batteries uh, last so long? And I think part of it is that when they started, they started with a good set of uh, probably new, but certainly the high quality, high capacity commercial NICAD cells. They then had a, a matching process that they went through where they eliminated suspect cells and they also uh, matched the capacity of the cells to each other and picked a bunch that were the best matched. And they, they note in a couple of places, it's not the best cells, it's the best matched to each other cells. Part of their elimination process was they did things like they x-rayed the cells, they put them under a, a very high discharge, and anytime they saw something that they didn't like or that didn't look like the rest of them, they took those cells out of consideration. They started with either 100 or 150 cells and picked from those the best match. So they had a large pool to begin with, and I think having a large pool increases your chances statistically of coming out with a good set that's matched to each other. Uh, in addition, the time between when they knew they had a launch opportunity and the time they had to deliver the cells and, and when U11 was actually launched was a very short campaign. It was only uh, you know, several months that they had. And a, a side effect of this is the cells that they picked, assuming they started as new, they were still pretty new when they were launched. Uh, the satellite didn't have a launch delay. The batteries didn't sit on a shelf or in a refrigerator for any period of time. So the, the cells were, were not aged when they launched. Uh, in addition, the orbit of UO11 has long periods of time when the satellite is in full sun, there's no eclipse. So there'll be long periods of time when the batteries are not being heavily taxed, if at all. And that'll increase the lifespan because they're just sitting there charged uh, with very little demand put on them. You've done some, some work on, on recreating the orbit to, to show the, the environment that the batteries faced in, in space, right? Uh, yeah, there's a program called uh, Illum by DK3WN, and you can give it a set of, of two line elements, and it will plot the, the orbits and tell you, you know, how much uh, full sun and how much eclipses you get. Uh, are there any other missions that weren't, or the orbit wasn't as good, where these sets of batteries uh, also lasted longer than expected? The Microsats, which also had battery packs made of cells that that Larry and or his team matched, uh, also had some rather long lifetimes. Um, prior to Larry's uh, work with the batteries, some of the earlier satellites, uh, AO6, 7, and 8, all suffered from battery failures. 
as their end of life event. Uh, A07 is, is now back in service, um, but it, it looks like just the batteries failed shorted. So the power from the solar panels gets to the electronics, but the batteries don't have any capacity to hold any charge. So as soon as the satellite is no longer illuminated by the sun, everything's gonna turn off. Um, it, we're just lucky that that worked out the way it did. If it had failed to open, then uh, the satellite wouldn't be working. But it'd be better if we had a long life uh, battery pack. That was part of the motivation to try to figure out what Larry and his team did to match the cells. Uh, as far as I know, he didn't publish anything that gives a step-by-step -step procedure for how to reproduce his results. Um, he talks about some of his early results. He has a NICAD hypothesis that he wrote up. Uh, and again, it's the set of best match to each other cells, not the best cells, but exactly what they did and how they did it is not outlined in the, any step-by-step -step procedure that was published anywhere, at least as far as I know. So you became interested in either figuring out or finding out um, this particular procedure to sort of get it published and documented uh, so that anybody that wanted to use a well-matched set of cells to make a, a battery uh, using NICAD uh, would, would be able to, to do this. Or at least something close to what they did uh, that we can use as a starting point to, and then we'll improve on it as we get better and we find out what works and what doesn't. How hard was it to find out the details of this procedure? Um, there's bits and pieces that Larry wrote on uh, AMSAT BB over the years. If you go search through the archives for all his postings, you can find stuff that he wrote. Um, and I did track down one member of the, the team who actually did a lot of the hands-on work. And it, it doesn't look like there was anything special magic or higher order mathematics that they did to match the cells. They did have a process that they followed to uh, measure the capacity of each cell. And, but they didn't do any you know, higher order mathematics on the charge discharge curves that they plotted to try to figure out which cells were best matched. They just tried to pick the curves that looked most they similar. They plotted them on paper and, and looked at it and said, this group here looks like a good group that's well matched to each other. This group here looks like a good match. Okay, so in, in recreating all of the, these tests uh, with modern equipment, we, we actually have some significant advantages in that we can use um, you know, automated testing uh, fixtures to test the, the capacities and the, to get the charge and discharge, discharge curves. And we, we also have a lot of inexpensive and powerful mathematic programming to, you know, you could either use a uh, you know, Python script or even uh, or you can use MATLAB, you can use, um, you know, a spreadsheet. Yeah. You know, probably put them all in Excel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we now have, uh, you know, a way to, to recreate, to test and to, to publish all of this work, uh, you know, that is a lot easier than, than plotting them out maybe on a transparency and, and then picking out the best ones by, by looking at them. So in, in order to, to recreate this, it's sort of like the first step uh, to maybe moving on to other battery chemistries, more the ones that are, that are currently being looked at for use in space. Although the, the matching requirements of lithium ion are different than the matching requirements of, of NICAD, there are still uh, an awful lot of NICADs available and as an inexpensive and uh, well-studied thing to, to put in space, it's, it's really not a bad choice. Uh, is, is your hope that, uh, that missions coming up that are experimental or amateur might, might want to use some of these packs that have well-matched cells? What, what we'd like to try and do is uh, take some of the cells that we have, plot the charge discharge curves for them, come up with a battery pack made of those cells, uh, stress test it here to make sure that, that it does have a long life on the ground, uh, and then repeat the process, uh, but find a ride for it so that we can actually verify that it works in orbit. 
Um, we'd be looking for a satellite, uh, probably one that is not launched from the ISS, um, something more like a, a sun synchronous orbit. Uh, the ones launched from the ISS, the, the, uh, the orbit's gonna put you in uh, sunlight and eclipse with, with a rather large eclipse on every orbit. Uh, but, but also the lifespan just from a, from a, the height of the orbits, uh, stuff launched from the ISS is not gonna last very long to begin with. So to, to validate that we actually have a long lived battery pack, we don't want something that comes out of the ISS. Have you discovered anything really surprising in your investigation so far? Uh, some of the notes that, that Larry uh, did write talk about how the, the battery manufacturer that they were using would measure the ingredients for the electrolyte with a front end loader. And I, I always thought this was a, a comment about the, the relative inaccuracy of the uh, amounts of ingredients that were mixed together. Um, but some other commentary I found suggests that it is more a commentary about contaminants uh, that might be in the electrolyte if they didn't uh, you know, wash out the front end loader sufficiently after they used it for something other than electrolyte ingredients. Uh, so there, that there might be some impurities in there. Um, but I, I don't know, because I don't know the company that made the batteries and um, the x-raying that they did, uh, Larry only notes that he saw some things that he didn't like and eliminated those cells from consideration, but he doesn't say what he saw. So it, it may have been contaminants uh, or it may have been some of the internal welds that uh, either didn't look good or just didn't look like all of the other cells that they x-rayed. And so they were eliminated. He doesn't actually say what it was that they saw, just that they didn't like it. Okay, so it was it was something that they saw on an X-ray. So, it... and that I, I think there was only two or three of the cells. Okay. Uh, the Do you know are... what kind of machine they they had access to or or, or used? They supposedly got access to a X-ray machine uh, at some dentist's office and X-rayed the cells uh, vertically so that they could look down uh, the cell. And I think th they were either looking for the welding or the, the uh, contamination. What's your plans for publishing this work? So um, once we get to something that works <laughs> and we've verified that we have good procedure, uh, we'd like to write it up, get published, get feedback, um, get other people to also reproduce our results and perhaps suggest improvements, uh, and then eventually expand it out to other battery technologies. Uh, for starters, though, we're just looking at the NICADs. Something that I found to be um, surprising was how, how little, um, in terms of like academic work or guidelines, how, how little about uh, cell matching is, is easily accessible. I found uh, a paper from um, uh, years ago that's a, it's quite a good one about, about cell matching uh, from the Navy. Um, and it was very good practical knowledge. It, it didn't rely on, on fancy mathematics. Uh, this was just curve fitting, least mean squares types of, of calculations and not too many points either. You know, it, it could be done in a lab with uh, relatively simple equipment by somebody who was just checking every now and then to get to get the points. And then uh, a more recent paper about cell matching that looked uh, more into environmental cell matching. So, so the performance of uh, under temperature. So you would, you would pick the cells that, that could perform in the temperature range you wanted to. This was for an industrial application. So the temperature range was quite uh, demanding. And that was pretty much it. So I was, I was intrigued by, um, by the, to me, uh, the non-intuitive part of this was that you don't want the best cells, that you wouldn't just pick the best cells out of a, a group because they may not work together very well as a battery. And, uh, you know, it, it might be worth describing exactly what happens with batteries when you, when you do that, when you pick the very best 
uh, and put them together to make those, put to, when you pick the very best cells and you put them together in a battery, it doesn't necessarily give you a good battery. Uh, and maybe we should explain why. Well, one, if they're not well matched, uh, one or more of the cells will be discharged before the others and potentially gets discharged to a greater amount than the others. And when this happens repeatedly, uh, that battery or those two batteries become more likely to either fail or potentially reverse before the others. If, when you say reverse, you mean like you have a, a multiple cells in a battery, and even though they were all picked because they were amazing individual examples, you might have one that yep. is being driven backwards, it's being charged in reverse, is that what you mean? It, uh, one of the failure modes is that the polarity of the battery reverses and it drags down the other cells. But uh, the battery pack is only as good as the weakest cell that's in the pack. So when that one fails, then that one potentially uh, can't hold a charge anymore. And so it no longer contributes voltage and current uh, to whatever the load is. And if they're well matched, then they should all charge up together as a group and they should all discharge together as a group. And the voltages should be similar as they uh, charge and discharge so that there isn't any one uh, that's being taxed more than, than the rest. Because once one of them fails, then the whole battery pack is in trouble. Okay, so you can have a case where you have an all-star team, but the the difference between those batteries is pretty can be pretty large percentage-wise, and that that pack might fail well before one that was middle of the range, you know, in terms of capacity. But they all work together as a good team. You know, they're, they're, the, the difference between the the batteries wasn't that that much, and that no may last like a, many many times longer than the all-star team. Yeah, we're going for a long life, uh, not best performance. And what, what Larry and his team uh, noted in several places is when you're doing the matching, you want the cells that are best matched to each other, not the best cells that you have. I think U11 holds the records for the uh, largest number of charge discharge cycles uh, and most orbits uh, to still have a functioning battery pack. What we don't want is the, the battery pack to fail after a couple of years and the rest of the electronics are all still good. Now, if we uh, got ejected out of the, the ISS, then we only need to last for you know, maybe a couple of years before we re-enter anyway. Uh, but if we get into a, a higher orbit or uh, something more sun synchronous, uh, then we want the battery pack to last as long as the electronics, if not longer. Yes, this is BK3WM's uh, Illum program. And you can uh, see from this one on your average day, uh, the ISS spends a lot of time in eclipse. Now there's a little snippet there where it's, it's in full sun, uh, maybe for a couple of days. But most of the days you're looking at uh, 15, 16 orbits, and there's a good chunk that's in sunlight, but there's also a good chunk that's in eclipse. Okay, and in terms of, and, of, a, of the challenge for a battery, is this a, a, is this a harsh, is it harsh conditions for a battery? I would imagine that this is, is worse for your battery because uh, you've got lots of time where you, you're gonna have to run off the batteries if you're doing anything on the eclipse side and you only have a limited amount of time on the sunlit side to recharge the batteries before the next eclipse. Okay, that, that puts it into so, a, a visual format that is uh, pretty, pretty clear, easy to see. You can also see it changes throughout the year. And let's put the... So this looks different than the ISS. This is different because this is U11. <laughs> so the, the eclipses are shorter and there's periods of time, if I recalculate this for earlier in the year. Uh, 
Uh, there's periods of time when there's no eclipses at all. So in terms of battery um, management or battery load, then this is in, probably pretty benign. Um, we, it, we have to go look at the telemetry and, and see, but my guess is that when you're in full sun, you're not taxing the batteries much, if at all. You're either running off the solar panels or minimally using the, the batteries while you run some experiments. Uh, and they'll get charged right back up again because you're in full sun. How two different orbits can have dramatically different battery situations and a very cool program. Anything that you see on a particular cell that doesn't look like what all the other cells look like doesn't matter what it is, if it's impurities in the electrolyte or if it's the, the welds uh, internal to the cell don't look like the rest of the cells. Whatever it is, set that cell aside. Because if you didn't eliminate the bad ones, you wouldn't know just from matching the capacities that this one had a like a bad internal weld or had some contaminants or something. Right. So it's a, it's a two-pronged approach of, of both matching the capacities and eliminating anything that you think is suspect for any reason. Yeah, we, we should see that come out of the, the measurements and uh, comparing them in something like a Jupyter Notebook or Excel. Um, that makes it a lot easier to, to say, okay, you know, uh, group them or, or put a, a visualization. And we should see a large number of cells that all are very similar out to some outliers, depending on what axis you're looking at. If we're just looking at capacity, we will see that. We'll see a distribution of capacities. Um, if we're looking at, at matching um, curves to each other, it gets a little more complicated, but we will see some clusters of curves that are very, very close to each other. Um, we do have temperature probe that, that goes along with the voltage and current measurements. Um, so if there is any misbehaving battery with respect to temperature, then those, those come out as well. You know, they set them should, aside. Yeah, set them aside. Um, you know, so there's a couple of different things to look at, and all of this is, will be available. Uh, the, as, as the batteries are being measured in um, the remote lab, Remote Lab West at Open Research Institute, then each curve is put uh, into the repository. So the raw data is available for anybody to look at. And over time, the measurements that we're talking about making will also be in the repository. So there's, there's multiple ways you can, you can uh, look at the different sets of data. Uh, if there's something that we're not doing, then, then it can be either suggested or, or you can go ahead and do it and then add it to the repository as well. And so the, the links to that are, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll put those in uh, on the screen. Okay, and then here are the devices under test. Yeah, just used some uh, battery carriers and hooked up some anodes. And here is the analyzer. Okay, so what is this part? What are you doing? Uh, I am labeling each one of these batteries so that when we have data, it matches what number we assign it. So this is two and four. We're redoing two and doing four here. Okay. So I'm going to go here and we set up each run. Looks like they've finished. We can select our last test regimen. We have everything loaded, figured out how to do that. And then, see blue therm here, that's the left channel. Let's select our right channel test. We have white therm. This is going to be four. And this is going to be two. Okay. Hey, Paul. So I'm going to disconnect the thermistors and set up a new battery. A little bit messy, but that's okay. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> so here's our second cell. Put that in there. Got some tape. And uh, throw the thermistor wherever we can, really. That'll do. 
and then repeat the same process for our number four cell. This is number one. Here's number four. And then put our little thermistor back on. And we're good to go. So we go over to our program here. Then we just uh, check between these. You can see the starting voltages. One's lower than the other because the second one has already done one of these runs. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. These will uh, calibrate, run a quick charge cycle, equalize, and then discharge, and then recharge, and then equalize again. Cool. That's All about right, it. about how long does it take? Um, Usually north is six hours. Okay. All right, so this is our third or fourth round of tests? Um, I think third. Okay. We're redoing a second cell. Yeah, we accidentally interrupted it a little early. All right, thank you. Yeah. More soon. So here we are a little bit later in the process, and this is what the battery analyzer shows us. So the black line is voltage. The blue line is current. The purple line is temperature. And so what, what you can see is voltage coming up to charge. So you can see a lot of inrush current um, going going into the cell uh, and then this long right so that'd be right here yeah. and this long flat pretty low charge. yeah it's called the equalization charge uh, so you can see it come up and then and then it's the voltage is holding steady so now at this point this is discharge so it's a discharge set part of the of the curve uh, and you can see that uh, as when it cycles, you cycles the temperature spikes yeah yeah as as we are, you know, we're, we're now producing a lot of current, so the current is negative, it's going, going out of the cell, and the temperature is going up, and the voltage is coming down, so it completely empties it out, and then it's going to uh, start charging again. Those are the three different curves that we have to work with from the battery analyzer. The other side. Yeah, let's go yeah. to the other set okay. of curves, because this, this one is showing us you can see the, the initial charge. A little further along. Yeah, and then equalization charge, and then discharge uh, with, with the temperature you know, going up and then, and then down. And you can see, here's, a, here's the charge part, another equalization, and, and over here you can see that it has started a discharge curve, and you can see the temperature going up again. Yeah, if I were to put my hand on the mount here, I can see that uh, well, you can feel, it feel hot. a little bit warmer than the other cell at the moment. Yeah. But now the, Not the curve much. does look very dramatic. But look at look at the temperature over on the, the far right. You can see it's just going up by a few degrees. Yeah. Just hitting its peak now. All right. Uh, Any other comments? Yeah. Um. These readouts give us some basic info. The same stuff that's charted over here. But the uh, the action times. Um. If you were to look here and compare along the graph here, you can see we're currently in the discharge portion of the uh, cycle. Um, and if you were to look back here, it reports we're uh, trying to hit peak charge, and then it equalizes. And uh, yeah, it's just about that. Should we be worried about these low capacity fail messages here? Uh, I think Did so. Some, sometimes so it the, seems a bit hit or miss. It might mm. have to do with the batteries needing to be conditioned. Okay, yeah, because these are brand new batteries. So, so we are continuing to learn how to, how to work with the battery curves. Uh, all of this gets saved into a file and put on the GitHub repository. And so each of these uh, data sets are, are available uh, to anybody through the, the repository. Now, when the run's finished, you basically repeat this process. We have a finished run here the next day. So go ahead and exit. And uh, you just pull the batteries off the mount, get them sorted with the uh, next set. And uh, once you have a good batch of data, you can go to the file viewer and then take your UBA files, and let's go with 37 here, and uh, file, and then write data. And what this will give you is a CSV file, and from there uh, it'll report to documents, VenCon, reports and logs, you can find it there. And uh, once you have a good batch, you can upload it to the repository.
Now when I have a good batch of these, around 10 or so, um, just go ahead and upload it to the repository. Uh, sometimes I use Discord to uh, get the files over, but uh, sometimes I can upload it from this terminal as well. And uh, at that point, you just uh, keep doing runs, keep doing file transfers until you're uh, all out of batteries. If you were looking at the uh, UBA console earlier, you might have noticed we had a failure. I think it was for this cell. Um, and whenever that happens, we go ahead and retest them on the mount. The working theory is that the batteries might need to be conditioned. Whenever we encounter a uh, failure for capacitance, we go ahead and swap the cell on the mount. And uh, from there, it usually tends to play nice, but uh, we've had a few that we still need to retest. You can see that the next run is set up here. Uh, this would be the 40s. Yeah, 39 completes that group. So uh, we're starting another run here. And uh, once we have about 10, we grab the CSVs like earlier and uh, go ahead and upload those. You know that this is such a fun project to do because it really highlights how well a job everyone did uh, with this with the battery packs uh, for for UO11. This is some really good work, and uh, it's it's really fun to be able to kind of bring it out and prove it out, and then publish it to show uh, what a quality, competent job amateurs did uh, on this in this for the small sets and for UO11 high quality, uh, sta high standards, and high performance that has been achieved in, in the past and that we'll continue to do uh, in the present and in the future of the amateur satellite service. Well, we, well, we want to prove out our hypothesis that we have a long-lived battery pack. So we need to find a, a satellite that will be a long-lived uh, mission. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be ideal. No, okay. Or uh, if if uh, anyone out there knows of a of a challenging terrestrial mission uh, like a buoy, or I, I'm not going to say balloon because these batteries are kind of heavy, um, but something like that a terrest a long long lived terrestrial mission that has to uh, has to last for a while uh, without any intervention, uh, then get in touch. We we may have the pack for you.